Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to The Future of Democracy, a show about the trends, ideas, and disruptions changing the face of our democracy. I'm Sam Gill, your host. It's an interesting moment in America for the conservative intellectual establishment. Progressive fervor for potentially radical state intervention in markets and on behalf of civil rights is as high as it has been in recent generations. And the Republican president has been at times as divisive within the establishment right as he has been across the country writ large. Yet this has also been a propitious moment for libertarian and market-oriented thinking. The ascendant Silicon Valley elite have a strong libertarian bent informed and reinforced by an engineering and technology-oriented culture. And belief in the power of free choice and free enterprise to drive innovation and solve problems remains at the heart of the American ethos, even as this worldview faces new challenges. One of the most unique and incisive voices in this environment has been Eli Lair. Eli founded the think tank R Street in 2012, and since then, the organization has been consistently willing to have an identity all its own. They have been early to technology issues, forceful on science and the climate, and aggressive on criminal justice reform. In a moment of soul searching across the political and policy landscape, it's the perfect moment to get Eli's take on a range of pressing topics. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to welcome to the show, Eli Lair. Thank you so much for having me, Sam. I'm flattered by that introduction. Oh, uh, thank, no, thank you for joining. It's all downhill from here. So, but thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. Probably um, since I didn't deserve that introduction. <laughs> thank you so much. No, absolutely. So I, I sort of want to dive right into it because we're, you know, we're months away um, from a choice um, about, about a big choice about what the direction of the country should be. And I'd love to know, you know, as someone who's overseeing a pretty complex um, policy uh, apparatus, you know, what do you guys see as the really critical short-term priorities for the country? There are any number of short-term priorities that could float to the top. And because of the nerdiness and deepness of some of our expertise, I'd probably have some members of my staff who would argue that uh, electricity policy is really, the, right. is really the key future issue. That said, I would point to a few key things. First, of course, the issue of very much in everybody's mind is racial justice. Uh, that is first in my mind right now. And it is a long-standing wound in America that people on the right as well as the left must do something about. Second, I would point to the fiscal situation facing the country. The, the long-term problems are fiscal for the country. And the $5 trillion in COVID spending brings a day of reckoning on entitlements far closer. COVID itself and the ensuing economic damage that was done is another major issue that must be confronted. And that has massive implications and may well have spillover effects in all sorts of other areas of policy. So those would be my top three on my screen. What do you, so let's talk a bit about sort of the moment of racial reckoning. And this is something you and I have talked about a little bit on our own, which is, um, you know, it may, it may not be the case that a commitment to formal equality is in any way a partisan issue in this country, but it absolutely is the case that there are perceptions um, that there is not um, bipartisan agreement on some really critical uh, dimensions of what a just country looks like, of what a racially just country looks like. And I think it's also the case that there is a really intense debate about this particular administration um, that I think has, has inflamed um, sensitivities and concerns about the future of race. Like as a, just sort of reflecting on the sort of ethos of the modern kind of conservative intellectual establishment, how is this moment different for the way that this issue is being talked about and thought about? I think it is, that's a very good question. The conservative intellectual establishment right now has been too shy sometimes to confront and talk about issues of race. After a history that at best, I would say was mixed among conservatives during the civil rights era, there came to be a time where people simply did not want to talk about it at all. That had a number of negative implications, including people thinking incorrectly that the conservatives in general didn't care about it. You add that to a president who clearly likes to be divisive generally. If you think he's just racially divisive, you have been watching, <laughs> you have been watching anyway. The, the idea that he's primarily motivated by racial divisiveness, 
No, because he's divisive on so many other issues too. Uh, so it, he can't be seen primarily as somebody who's trying to divide on race, so he tries to divide on everything else as well. Uh, and that in turn creates a very interesting situation. You have a group of people on the right who have some interest in looking more closely at some of these things, looking at policies and programs and procedures to see what the clearly unfinished work is. And you can see that energy directed to criminal justice, towards things like professional licensing reform, towards rethinking various social programs. On the other side, you have people who I think are not so much big in as really want to return to the idea of not thinking about it. Uh, in part because they're afraid, I think incorrectly, that solutions will be unpalatable to them. Mm -hmm. And you have people, of course, who are legitimately big in it. Uh, and that group, I want them to leave the Republican Party and the conservative movement, and I think they're just a disgrace. So I, I, you could argue about the size of those three factions. Uh, I would say that the middle faction is the largest uh, and the last one the smallest. What do you think about, I mean, so as I've been um, sort of watching this debate, debate precipitate, I mean, I've, I certainly think an important part of this moment has been um, for particular with regard to the middle faction, this has been a really important moment. It strikes me that the middle faction has been has felt obliged to speak up, and and, I, and that presages, I think, change. I mean, that's just the nature of social change. Yes. This is not this is not a new insight. This is letter from a Birmingham jail. This is the the middle faction needs to speak up for change. But as I look at the look at the sort of the 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 right, it seems to me it's been very easy to to express, you know, to kind of use the term of the day, allyship around issues of coercive state force. That's a natural for a libertarian. So qualified immunity reform, um, yeah. police violence. The place that it strikes me that it's, it, it's where I, I still am, I will be interested to see what happens is, you know, there, the part of this moment has been the mainstreaming of, of an idea that choices made a long time ago can get baked into a system in a way that overwhelm the power for, you know, an industrious individual to, to overcome them, you know, whether it's housing policy or economic policy, that's a, that's a really important argument that has that become much more mainstream, but how, how do you, re, how, how do you think about, you know, that the historical dimension um, that's a, an important part from the left of the discussion? I, I would actually give tremendous credit to the left for, raising the issue of structural racism. And I'm firmly convinced that structural racism, a really structural bigotry, is quite real and can have quite significant impacts on individuals' lives. I would argue, however, that much of the structural racism has been exercised through state coercion. And that removing some coercive powers of the state and also undoing some damage that they have done. So it isn't, it cannot just be a single thing. It is a major way, perhaps not the only one, but is a major way towards dismantling structural racism. Just to give two quick examples. Professional licensing systems uh, arose, in fact, partly as sort of a Northern version of Jim Crow. Yeah to keep African-Americans out of many of the professions. Now, there aren't very few of any have that explicit intention today, but they still serve that, uh, serve that function in some cases. Second, you can look at housing and zoning policy. The tremendous mandates for essentially racial segregation under some New Deal housing programs, the mandates are gone. The impacts in the form of things like uh, mandatory single family zone, which the president, after having an HHS secretary who was against it, is now himself uh, very much in favor of, because he views it as, as a way to divide people. So I see these things as examples of where people from the right can, can make a difference. So you look at some efforts at wealth redistribution and efforts to 
say that markets are intrinsically racist. Some of these I reject simply as, as untrue. Others of them, I am simply very worried about the unforeseen consequences of doing them. I also um, simply think that it is incorrect, as some thinkers on the left have, have posited, that the mere existence of a disparity is by itself proof positive of discrimination. It's certainly a necessary prerequisite for discrimination to see that discrimination has taken place. But there are reasons that are not insidious why disparities can exist. And a diverse society will have differences between groups, some of which it may be better to allow them to persist, even if they harm individuals. Yeah, I mean, that, well, but that was, that, uh, let's, let's home in on that, though, because I think that's an interesting philosophical issue. I mean, I don't, I don't think the argument, um, the argument, say, um, around sort of issues of disparate impact is, um, is that it's the, it's the evidence that um, discrimination that comes from a kind of mens rea, you know, an intent exists. I think it's to say there's, there's different kinds of discrimination. Some yes. discrimination is with intent, some is in the effect. Now, it does, mean, it does mean that they have an idea of a just outcome, and perhaps you re in certain cases you would just reject um, that a just outcome is always a kind of parity or a, a kind of equity, but I, it's, not all, it's not the ascription of, in, of, of no. intent. No, I don't actually, I think what you point to is a very important point and really almost a language problem between left and right. When conservatives talk about racism, they are thinking almost entirely about intent. I've noticed um, that it's almost entirely intentional. And by that definition, it's correct to say that there is very little racism in the modern United States, some, but not a lot. Uh, if you look at things with disparate impact, uh, which can definitely be racist, and again, this is where I think the right owes the left some, uh, some significant credit, uh, then you can find quite a lot of things. But the number of people who are actively trying to undermine people because of their skin color alone it is, I think, quite small. That doesn't mean that racism is not a problem. In fact, it may even mean that it's a bigger problem because intentions are not enough. How do you, as someone, um, you know, one of the themes that has come up in a lot of the conversations we've had about sort of the public culture of democracy on this show, uh, with, but frankly with guests who are extremely progressive and guests who are extremely conservative has been the challenge of, um, of polarization and the purity standard that it imposes around deliberation. And so I, like, I think of two, two examples that we've just talked about, criminal justice reform, uh, and, and housing policy reform. You know, there, there, there used to be a paradigm that would say, um, you know, um, that, that say some, some, uh, someone like you or our street might say, we, we think inclusionary zoning is good in the sense that we think we should dismantle some structures of zoning that actually restrict choice and result in discrimination. And so a progressive think tank might say, we want that and we also want substantial state investment in housing opportunity for a number of people. And there used to be a paradigm that said, that's what parliamentary systems are for, working that out. You don't, and what we seem to live in a moment where if, the, if, if both sides don't adopt in toto, you know, the self-same agenda, then it's hard to move forward. Th that's at least been my perception. So as someone who's actively working on these issues, how have you guys experienced some of these debates in real time? We certainly have. I have been uh, somebody at a foundation uh, told me that a position we held on an issue nothing to do with their portfolio was a reason that they would never work with our street. Mm -hmm. So this has happened, and there are cases of an enormous purity test uh, imposed by people. And it's particularly bad when you come to certain people in, uh, in elected office. Within the intellectual world, there is still a willingness on the part of many although not all, to work with people who are only sometimes going to agree with them and work towards some mutual goals. And that's how progress under the institutions we have always gets made. It's why we've managed to have significant criminal justice reform under this administration and in many states. 
um, more probably in states with Republican controls than in states with Democratic control. And that has been one example of people who may disagree on a lot coming together. But the extreme polarization and the fact that, you know, McGovern's platform today would be well to the right of the Democratic Party. Uh, and, you know, and for that matter, the Republican platform for 25 years has been well to the right of, say, what Nixon or Eisenhower would have run on. Uh, so it's certainly been a, it's certainly been a polarization of both parties, with the Republicans going first. And that, I believe, is leading to, to people essentially rejecting the idea of loyal opposition, which is key to a democracy. It's why, despite having enormous problems with the president, one of my biggest concerns is that he loses and is prosecuted criminally. I think that would be the type of thing that would destroy the possibility of, of democracy. If disagreeing with people and having bad policies is a criminal act, or people are brought up on charges for doing it, then who is going to want to serve and how will peaceful transitions of power be possible? So that to me is at the root of democracy. I mean, is the, but is the issue though there, is the issue so much that people won't want to serve is that it's just norm eroding? Because I mean, tr Trump presents a particular problem because there's a chance that he may, he, may, he may both be someone that many disagree with and someone who has committed criminal acts, right? That's part of the vexing yeah. dimension of Trump, right? Yeah, I am. Um, no, I, I agree with that. Um, I would simply say that it, it, certainly the nobody wants to serve could, could be seen as an overstatement. But yeah, it destroys the norms of, of peaceful transition of power at minimum. And that's, that's the enormous, that's been the enormous strength of our system. It's why we have the oldest single document constitution in the world by a lot. And uh, you know, that, that is seriously endangered by efforts to consider the very fact of the other side illegitimate. And it's growing on both sides. It's council culture is a mutual thing. Well, I think we, I talked actually a little bit about this with Marianne, the legal scholar Marianne Franks in a technology context. And, and you know, I, so what I would sort of argue is like, I, look, I think the zone of deviance can evolve. So I think it is possible to say, like, there are certain mutual commitments we do. So I think, for example, you know, in the way that, for example, that you talked about policy differences that you may have about particular reforms with regard to race, you also made really clear that you think racism is a problem, right? So that there's some, it, it can be important to declare what the parameters of the sort of acceptable moral zone are. Part of what we talked about was, you know, what are the consequences um, for disagreement? Are they retributive? you know, are they restorative, you know, and so it strikes me that part of the challenge in our political system is that these are, these are, these are institutions particularly designed to foster debate. Not every institution is designed for that, but these are institutions particularly designed to facilitate negotiation and horse trading. And so whatever consequences there are for deviance, are they consequences, what I'm hearing you say, that sort of ultimately undermine the warrants for even having the institution in the first place? Yeah, that, that's, that's what I think that's what I think is the enormous problem. If simply disagreeing becomes grounds for, for a, a problem, that was one of the big triumphs of the American Revolution, the speech and debate clause in the Constitution, saying that you could basically do anything you wanted as an elected representative of the people, say anything you wanted, at a time when the First Amendment, which wasn't even available at that time, was read much more narrowly, that at least when it came to discussing stuff on the floor of Congress, virtually nothing you said could be, could be used against you. That is an enormously important norm. And if it comes to the point that simply saying things becomes a reason to destroy somebody's career, which obviously it should be in some cases, there are certain things which people in certain careers should not say and deserve to have their careers destroyed for. But if it becomes general, like if any unacceptable statement ever becomes a problem, then it becomes an enormous problem, even absent a formal censorship regime. And that becomes a, and that really collapses the norms on which a deliberative Repu liberal Republican democracy are built.
So, you know, it strikes me, one dimension of this that I know you've been thinking about is um, you can, if, if, if one challenge is sort of norm erosion because views are evolving, then, you know, one solution is either to sort of seal off the institution from evolving views. The other institution is that the apparatus of policymaking, political parties, et cetera, they sort of realign, you know, and so they come to better reflect what the sort of what the social norms are and then legitimate debate can 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 happen and one of the questions we're getting in the chat is you know about how the 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 conservative establishment is or should be reacting to um, demographic changes that are happening in this country clearly changes in our sensibility and so I know you've thought a little bit about the question of realignment but what, what is what's like the optimistic take on what you just said like what are the ways that our system looks a little different so that we can maintain our democratic norms while evolving as a country Political scientists generally say that we've had six different versions of party alignment since the dawn of the Republic. And it seems to me like we're probably switching towards a seventh one. And if that tradition, and if that transition can be pulled off smoothly, then we'll probably be okay. And there's generally been a fair amount of turmoil. I mean, the sixth party system is the project of the civil rights movement. The one that we're currently in is a direct result of the civil rights movement. And I think that we may see a realignment of the parties in one way or another, and the factions that belong to each parties. I think it's unlikely, but it's possible even one of the parties could cease to exist under the same name uh, and be replaced by something else. But I think the factions are going to move and that parts of what now makes up the conservative movement will find themselves in different places than they are right now. Just you, can I tempt you to speculate more? Like, what do you think it could look like? Well, let me, let me preface this by saying that con conventional wisdom speculation on these things is wrong. If you told <laughs> somebody in 1954 <laughs> that the long-term effects of the sixth party system that would emerge from it would be that, in fact, congressional committees would still be chaired when the Democrats controlled the House, largely by old men running in safe districts of the South. If you told them that, they'd say, oh, so nothing's going to change. Right. But if you told them all of these old men will be African-American, you'd think they were insane and from the South, um, which is basically the case. We still have old Southern Democrats in safe districts running it. It's simply that there are progressive African-Americans rather than Jim Crow supporting whites. Um, so I think that it's very risky to do. Um, I see two, that said, saying that saying that I'm probably wrong. I think I, see, <laughs> I think I I think I see two scenarios that seem plausible to me. The first, which I would consider the more pessimistic one, is that we end up with two varieties of a populist party. We end up with left populist clustered of the Democratic Party and right populist cluster to the Republican Party. Both parties are generally anti-civil liberties for the most part. Neither of them are, are that good on anything. They both claim to speak for the people. Both consider the other illegitimate. Are both, the, the Republicans move well to the left on economic issues. Uh, the Democrats move somewhat further to the left and largely, and, and people like and ardent civil libertarians become increasingly uncomfortable with the Democratic Party. The likes of Ron Wyden become very uncomfortable in the party. That's probably the pessimistic one. You have two populist parties, you get between left and right populism. It's, it's roughly the, where the UK is now. Um, both parties are essentially populist. Uh, the more optimistic scenario, I would say, it is probably something closer to a class party divide, which might not be altogether bad. Um, that one party, which could as well be the Democrats than the Republicans, becomes more the party of uh, people who generally are doing pretty well, becomes more, uh, more, libertar more libertarian-ish in its, uh, in its uh, patterns, and it is not... Uh, is not socially oblivious to things, but is but is still you know on the side of is pro business um, in general and pro uh, and you know but 
but somewhat supportive of the safety net and so forth. Um, and the other party moves in a somewhat more populist direction, uh, becoming uh, more of sort of a uh, more of a downscale party. Uh, and it's up for grabs which one is which. I think in that you end up with two relatively ideologically diverse parties, in fact, because there are there are um, there are more possibilities there. And you have people who attach themselves to one or the other. And I think that will bring you more ideological diversity within the parties and within the country than, uh, than you would. So those are the two scenarios I would consider likely. Uh, under one, the Democrats become the big business party, uh, probably. The Republicans also move to the left economically, uh, but become... Uh, but also, uh, but the Democrats answer that by moving to the right on many important economic issues. That's interesting. I mean, do you, and has COVID shifted this? I mean, you alluded to the kind of fiscal policy that we backed into as a result of COVID. There's a good argument that we'll have to back into a similar fiscal policy around the climate, that it'll just happen naturally. Um, the and And certainly, progressive Democrats have leapt on that. I mean, they are, they are eager to argue not only that COVID merits this kind of fiscal intervention, but that it's the, it, it, it is the proof that we've been waiting for um, that, you know, call it neoliberalism has, has, uh, has vulnerabilities. As, so has COVID changed anything about what you think is at least possible? Oh, I think it definitely has. Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's actually resolved some issues. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've been fine with the idea of paid family leave myself, even though I'm, even though I cannot really ideologically justify it, but I think it's a good idea. <laughs> You're a human being, Eli. It's yeah. a lot. <laughs> yeah. um, but the, uh, you know, that which we've established is uh, is not going to go away, uh, obviously. And the soon and the increasing soonness of the fiscal reckoning for our major entitlement programs reduces the chances that we can come to agreements that would result in the type of means testing that could significantly do it. So that does mean a future with a government that's at least somewhat bigger. The question is, can we, there's no necessary inconsistency between enhancing the welfare state and freeing the market. Uh, and that is still up for grabs, I think, to some extent. And it doesn't necessarily follow that even a high tax society cannot have very free markets. That's so for the Nordic countries. They're in fact some of the most free market countries in the world and have some of the highest taxes. So it's two different things and you could end up with that. That government will permanently be bigger, I think is almost a certainty. I'm not crazy about it, but I would say it's almost a certainty. And it's necessary simply, uh, simply by keeping the promises of the entitlements, which are going to be politically impossible not to keep. Government will grow as a percentage of GDP. The question is, will it have more or less coercive power over people? I could see a future where coercive power is in important ways. And that, I think, would be the future I'd like to live in, whether the taxes are high or low. I mean, what do you, so let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Cause I, cause one of the things I absolutely can't, can't let this conversation um, end without touching on is the, is the sort of new vector of coercive power, which is uh, the major technology companies um, that we, that, that are, that are in our midst. And I know this is something that you've been doing a lot of thinking about. So I guess starting with just like a big picture question, like we're certainly in a kind of moment of tech lash. But analytically, what do you think are, are or aren't the, the, the real policy problems, uh, social and political problems that we face around, around technology? Sure. I have an article in uh, the American Interest that looks at this. But I would say briefly that the two big problems which have to be dealt with by public policy are disinformation and, and custody of personal data. I think that if those two can be dealt with, our existing structures and institutions combined with reasonable evolution of market processes 
should be able to solve the problems under a pretty laissez-faire paradigm, at least laissez-faire with regard to the status quo, not necessarily laissez-faire overall. Uh, so those are the two problems I think need to be confronted by public policy and cannot be solved solely through market, um, uh, through sort of natural evolution of market mechanisms. And I believe briefly that ethical codes similar to both medical and legal ethics and the code imposed by the comic book industry on itself offer a way to deal with both of those things. Say more, I mean, say more, you know, I've, I've read the piece, we'll send it around to all the readers, but say more about the comic book code. Cause I, a lot of, a lot of folks who, who are, aren't familiar with comics will say, really? I mean, disinformation feels to me like a crisis and comics feel to me like a form of leisure that can be more or less salutary. So it help unpack for our audience what, you, what you've been thinking about in particular and why you think it's a great analogy. So going back to the mid 1950s, comic books were absolutely pervasive as part of youth culture. Even though TV was in the great majority of American homes, more people, more young people spent time reading comics than watching TV. Among male youngsters, they would buy two to three comics a week on average. Female youngsters, about one. So it was just an enormous part of media. And by the mid-1950s, crime was actually rising quite quickly. It's actually some of the fastest crime increases we've had in history were in the early 50s. Uh, particularly juvenile crime. And there was a sense that comics had something to do with it. Whether or not this is right is a different story, but very serious people, including um, Fred Wertheim, who was the uh, chief uh, witness in the, Brown, in the Brown case, actually, on the desegregation side, believed that this was a very serious social problem. There were congressional hearings, and the comic book industry responded with the code based somewhat on the Hayes Code that applied to motion pictures that set standards for what comics should be. It was, in some ways, you would consider some parts of it really dated. But actually, it was well thought out and ahead of its time in some ways, at a time when things that we'd consider obscene were part of children's counting rhymes that forbid all racial prejudice in comics, for example, which was quite widespread in the early 50s. And it created something that was safe for children, which was the intended audience of almost all comics. Now, it was revised over time, and they realized that a total prohibition on any drug use meant that they couldn't tell an anti-drug story, for example. Right. So that was revised. And a variety of things were made in the late 80s when the gay rights movement was just getting off the ground. It also was ahead of its time in prohibiting anti-gay stuff in comics. It eventually became defunct by the fact that comics became a serious literary medium, which was marketed mostly to adults. And it just wasn't relevant anymore, yeah. as it was designed for kids. But it had enormous commercial success for the comic book industry and dealt with something that was widely perceived as a harm and clearly could not have been good. And the same is so, by the way, about so much disinformation in particular. Uh, is the Internet Research Agency, the Russian troll farm itself, necessarily slanting the elections? Probably not. Uh, but it still obviously cannot be a good thing. And it's wide, it was widely socially desired to do something about it. And these types of codes can have a significant role in helping people and doing it without a direct state censorship at all. And widely adopted, they can change the entire medium. Now, there'll still be corners turned, but that's the point. That's one of the reasons why it's good that they're private. So what, how would it work exactly? The, co the companies would come together and formulate standards around acceptable, co they'd effectively harmonize their content moderation policies. What would it look like? They would, the way I, so they deal with both issues, obviously, how they, how they take custody of data and content moderation. I envision that the data custody would be almost entirely harmonized, that the content moderation might be uh, to some extent determined by what users wanted. Users might even have the ability to pick from a list of content moderators. Mm. 
funded by the platforms could be one way of doing it so that you could, um, you know, you could decide, I don't want any adult content on my platform and anything that might be sexually explicit, I just want off. And you could pick a content moderator that would do that. Or uh, you could decide, yay porn. And you could have all of that you wanted, but you'd still, um, you'd still, you know, have, uh, you'd still, you know, if there was obvious disinformation, you'd still be, you'd still have a way of flagging that. Uh, so it, it could be decided on by individuals and there would probably be some universal standards. For example, things produced by foreign governments should obviously be flagged uh, on any platform. Things that are, uh, you know, incitements to violence, speech that's clearly illegal, child pornography, child sexual exploitation should obviously be illegal on all of them. Now, these are already, these are already standards, although they're, although they could be truly harmonized because they obviously aren't between the platforms. So I'd probably envision it as something like that. Uh, and perhaps platforms could, could, you know, even say this is a totally family safe platform. So like Facebook doesn't allow any real sexual explicit material could, uh, could, could make that promise. And there would be a definition of exactly what that meant. So it would be more complex than the comic book code, more like the MPAA system in practice. I mean, what do you, you know, one of the sort of obvious kind of arguments I'm sure you've thought about would be, you know, look, that the whole problem with the internet is that, um, that um, you don't, um, you don't, you don't transact over, over, mm -hmm. there's not a movie with a rating. It's that you go to what you think is a G rated movie and the imperative of the platform to keep you engaged leads you into an R rated movie without even knowing it. And you leave the experience being pro whatever the right. R-rated content was. How have you, I mean, look, I'm not saying that's an accurate argument, but that's certainly a sensibility about internet regulation. How, how do you react to that? So it's an interesting question. And I would say that first, the proper content codes would in part do exactly that. They would say what you see is what you get. Yeah. And in fact, the one of the, the real teeth behind this are the FTC's um, Title V powers against generally unfair trade practices, which were used against companies that claimed to use uh, the comic book code but didn't. Oh, okay. There was, there was one case where they threatened to use it, the company stopped doing it, so it never went into full enforcement action. But that happened once with the comic book code. Um, and it's been done once with the MPAA code. All of that was also just trademark stuff as well. So there are cases of, of this being done. And, if you, and the answer is that if that happened to somebody, if they said, we're G-rated, you ended up in an R-rated content or whatever, whatever it was, then that would, that's clearly illegal under current law if it's, if it's, clearly, um, if it's clearly advertised as such. Uh, courts have been unwilling to reach this issue because of CDA 230. Yeah. But I think that if there were a widely agreed upon universal code, regardless of what 230 says, people who advertise they were following the code, courts would, would weigh in on that. It just strikes me as, as obvious that they would, um, if that were the case, because how could they, how could they not? It's clearly, they're clearly violating any number of norms and laws if they do it that way. So I think that there would be legal protection if there were a voluntary industry-wide code, which is one of the, which is, as somebody who wants to keep CDA 230 very much intact, that's one of the downfalls that I see right now is that the courts have basically said we're not going to weigh in on anything. And under the language of the law, they might be right. But if there were an industry-wide code, then they would start weighing in. And you'd end up with a body of case law uh, that you might turn some of it into statutes or overrule it with statutes over time, which is, I think, the way these things should evolve. Professional ethics can take a very long time to get into statute. Uh, informed consent for medicine has only been in statute for uh, about 20 years now, even though it, even though you can find parts of it that date back to ancient Greece. So 
It's been in statute of the UK for I think five years. So you can have things that are widespread practices but aren't necessarily statutory no. or are a matter of common law. So I want to, I mean, there's a lot more we could, we could, we could talk about on this, but I, I, we're, we're running low on time. Um, and I, so I want to give you a chance before we go to, you know, throw a bone to your, to your utility regulation folks or someone else on staff. What's the, what's the, what's the biggest long-term policy issue that we don't talk enough about in your view? Oh, uh, that's a good question actually, because I, I tend to be interested in just about just about everything. I think that it's um, the burden of harmful behaviors generally that is imposed on our health system and what we can do about them. Mm. The, we've been talking more about opioids, but probably not enough given the increasing, uh, uh, increase in you know, deaths of despair. Uh, we're doing nothing about a rising suicide rate, particularly among women. Uh, there's been no federal action on that. And you have a wide range of behaviors. And my own analysis is that we're t both sides end up being too hung up on abstinence only approaches, rather than saying if you're doing something harmful, you can do it in a less harmful way, maybe get mm. benefits without costs. Now, the mm. left mostly gets this when it comes to uh, sex and drugs. Yeah. And the right mostly gets it when it comes to tobacco, in my judgment. Uh, and those are, and basically tobacco is number one for killer. Opioids are number two. Sexual behavior with, the, with protease inhibitors is a very distant third, but uh, obviously has other has other negative consequences. Sure. Uh, and we have tremendous knowledge that people engage in this range of behaviors because they get some benefit or utility out of it that they perceive and that they want to. And people for a variety of hang up reasons have decided that we should push that if people can't stop doing these things entirely, uh, send messages that you're bad or sinful or awful if you don't stop doing these things entirely. You know, you must quit or die, basically. And you have, you know, AA has a 6% success rate, which is a quit or die program. Knowing that it's free and it's helped millions. Uh, I don't, I don't, AA is fine. But uh, it's probably not hurting anybody. But abstinence-only approaches when it comes to dealing with harmful behavior have been an enormous burden on society as a whole. And if we can move away from abstinence only for everything and say basically people will do things that we know are harmful and they'll do them because they want to, uh, we can tell them about it, we can educate them and some people will avoid doing these things if they're educated, some will not. And we need to figure out ways to make them less harmful because we cannot stamp out and never have managed to entirely stamp out any harmful behavior that people find utility in doing. Phenomenal. Well, thank you. Uh, you can follow Eli uh, on Twitter at Eli Lair DC, and you can follow R Street at RSI. As always, we'll send these two right after the show. We'll send out the American uh, Spectator article as well. We put it in the chat. Um, Eli, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's been fantastic talking. Thank you for everything. Take care. Take care. All right, everyone. We've got some great shows coming up the next few weeks. On September 3rd, we'll have legal scholar Olivier Sylvain, law professor at Fordham University. We'll pick up right where we left off with Eli in discussing issues of harmful content on the internet. On September 10th, we'll have Nicole Austin Hillary from Human Rights Watch to talk about civil rights and voting. And on September 17th, we'll welcome Professor Kathy Cohen from the University of Chicago, an expert on race in America. As a reminder, this episode will be up on the website later. You can see this episode and any episode on demand at kf.org slash fdshow. You can also subscribe to the Future of Democracy podcast on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Email us at fdshow at kf.org. Or if you have questions for me, just send me a note on Twitter at the Sam Gill. Please stay for 30 seconds to take a two-question survey. And as always, we will end the show to the sounds of Miami singer-songwriter Nick County. You can follow and check out his music on Spotify. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great week.